Hello, and welcome to this FATF webinar, uh, where we'll, we'll be talking about the use of crowdfunding for terrorist financing. Uh, crowdfunding has become an established part of the financial landscape over the past 20 years or so. Uh, most of us here on this uh, webcast, I'm sure, have used uh, crowdfunding before, uh, possibly for sponsoring a friend or colleague on a charity run, uh, perhaps for supporting uh, someone who suffered a, a tragedy or just for contributing to a joint gift for a friend or family member. Uh, crowdfunding has also become uh, an important way of raising funds for startup companies. And crowdfunding is also, because of its flexibility, uh, has become quite important for certain groups that have traditionally faced barriers in accessing the more established uh, uh, channels of finance. Specifically, I'm talking about uh, groups that operate in conflict areas, uh, non-governmental groups, and also uh, charities that may pop up on an ad hoc basis around natural disasters. Um, so, so crowdfunding has been a sort of milestone financial innovation um, and a force for good. Uh, but of course, like most legitimate uh, financial mechanisms, uh, crowdfunding can also be misused. Um, and in particular, it can be attractive to uh, terrorist groups who who's, may see its uh, flexibility and its ease of access, the ability to be able to uh, reach a very wide global audience instantly. And to do so, of course, with anonymity, it makes it particularly attractive to such groups. Um, so I'm really happy to be joined here today to be uh, by a really great panel who, who have experience in this area uh, to discuss this. I'd just like to start by introducing the panel. Um, first, we have uh, Hans, uh, Dr. Hans Jakob Schindler, uh, who's the Senior Director of the Counter uh, Extremism Project in New York and Berlin. Um, Hans is involved in a number of organizations in this area and has a background both with the German government and with the United Nations. We also have Svetlana Martinova, who's a senior legal officer at the United Nations Counterterrorism Committee, uh, who has a lot of experience in Central Asia and Eastern Europe in this field. Um, we also have Matthew Murray, who is the Director of Financial uh, Crimes and Regulatory Affairs at the crowdfunding platform that we're all probably familiar with, uh, GoFundMe. Uh, we also have uh, Anna Narotek, uh, who's a senior policy analyst at the Department of Finance in, uh, in Canada, who is one of the, uh, the co-leads of this uh, FATF project, which put together the report on crowdfunding and terrorist finance. Um, so uh, I, I, in terms, before we get started, a little bit of a, a sort of housekeeping issue. Um, at the bottom of your screens, you should see an area panel um, where you can post questions uh, to the panelists. Uh, I can't promise that we're going to get through of all, all the questions that you'll have, but that those that channel will be monitored. And at the end of the uh, webcast, we will get to as many of those questions as we can. So if I can uh, kick off uh, to start with it, I'd like to just ask Hans a question. Um, just really on this, Hans, could you maybe tell us what are the, the main ways in which crowdfunding can be abused uh, for terrorist financing? Thank you so much. It's truly an honor for me and for my organization to be part of this webcast. Thank you so much to uh, the FATF for the invitation. And of course, thanks to you, Tom, for moderating. Um, look. The good news of all of this project is that we are not dealing with a new terrorist methodology on how to finance itself. It's a very classic method that terrorist organizations are going to solicit funds from their sympathizers and supporters. But of course, we're talking about a technical innovation on how to do this and how to uh, increase your global reach. Uh, and that is based on crowdfunding platforms and other communication technologies. As the report has pointed out, and as we as CEP have documented, um, there really are four typologies. The first one is what we're all familiar with, the misuse of charitable and nonprofit causes um, now here in a new technical disguise, i.e. now misusing crowdfunding platforms that are set up for exactly this um, uh, and to reach globally rather than just locally or regionally. Um, here, of course, we have two variants. Number one, one that is set up with the full understanding of everyone who participates that this is a terrorism financing activity. And the other one is existing charitable 
uh, causes being misused by terrorist groups. The second one is unfortunately we've seen as global platforms are getting a little bit stricter of who they allow on their platforms, the emergence and in some cases, even the setup of specific crowdfunding tools or platforms online by uh, terrorists and violent extremists themselves, i.e. they built the platform in which they, through which they then run their, their, their crowdfunding uh, operations. And then, of course, this is not happening in isolation. So also social media, which is a key communications and propaganda tool for terrorism uh, and terrorists anyway, are also misused for crowdfunding purposes. And finally, of course, the misuse of virtual assets in combination with crowdfunding platforms. And here, the particularly concerning move is to, a little bit away from Bitcoin, which is the most well-known, but also the most transparent uh, cryptocurrency in existence, towards more anonymity enhancing tools. The privacy coins, i.e. coins that encrypt the wallet or the blockchain or both, uh, as well as the use of mixes and tumblers to really obfuscate the flow of the funds. As it's really important to understand that while there are these four typologies, um, very regularly, um, terrorism finances, in particular, those who are more on the sophisticated side, i.e. the big organizations, the uh, large global networks that have done this for many, many years, combine this, i.e. combine of social media with a crowdfunding platform, uh, combining of virtual co uh, currencies with a dedicated platform. So these combinations are always important. From the private sector perspective, i.e. those who run the platform, and Matthew is going to explain a little bit more about this. Of course, this is very different from the, in inverted comma, normal terrorist content moderation technologies and methodologies that the global platforms have already been working on since really the advent of ISIL in 2014, in that you now have to combine your content moderating tools and experience with actual classic counterterrorism financing skills that are not pervasive in these platforms, including in many of the crowdfunding platforms. Um, surprisingly, most of the crowdfunding platforms and Matthew's platform is a notable and very honorable exception here, uh, is that their terms of services do talk a lot about crime and fraud, they talk about violence, but they do not have the sentences terrorism and financing and the words terrorism and financing in the same sentence, which means if you don't have it in your terms of services, you don't have moderation capability built in in your platform either. Meaning on the one hand, you don't have the skills. On the other hand, you lack awareness of how your platform may be misused. Academic research that my organization and others have done, of course, uh, can really help to fill in these complex gaps uh, both by policy uh, makers, law enforcement, as well as in the crowdfunding platform, because uh, crowdfunding sector, because it's really a complex um, environment and it's difficult for authorities, especially if we're talking about violent extremism, where there is not the same legal framework than if you talk about straightforward terrorism financing, to really understand that and to help the private sector to raise their awareness on how their platforms are going to be misused and are being misused. And I'll hand over to Max to explain a little bit about the private sector perspective. Thank you very much, Hans. Yeah, Matthew, could you jump in there and just give, give a bit of perspective on that, sort of the complexities around that of the, of the crowdfunding ecosystem? Yeah, sure thing. And uh, first off, though, thank you, Tom, for moderating and for having us all here today. And thank you, Hans, as ever, for the well-researched and well-explained answer. Um, as far as the complexity goes, even the simplest crowdfunding platforms are often technology platforms that sit on top of payment processes processors who themselves sit on top of banks. As you can see with that, uh, that could present difficulties with law enforcement and with partnerships in mitigating risky activity. And so it's super important that we think about expansively because apart from the plans, uh, really looking at the activity, any technology that offers you the ability to share a link, whether that's a mobile wallet or a bank account, can essentially be a crowdfunding platform. Um, I think that Hans really struck at that quite well when he spoke about the proliferation of methods presented by new technologies. And we need to make sure that we are, you know, really taking the time to learn that both private and public sectors.
Great. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. That's great. Um, Anna, can I move over to you if, if, if I can? Uh, one of the interesting aspects of the report were the, the case studies, the, the real world ex examples uh, that, that were outlined. Uh, I know you're not an investigator yourself. You, you focus on policy, but maybe you could just um, uh, talk us a little bit uh, through those and tell us, you know, what was the thing, thing that you found most striking about those uh, case studies of the investigations? Sure, Tom, thank you. And good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I think what I'll share here is when we initially started this project, we weren't sure what kind of visibility national authorities across the FATF would have into crowdfunding activity. We do know that terrorist groups use various financing techniques when they raise funds and to achieve their goals. And some of these techniques are affected by things like the group's geography, where they're located, where their support groups are located, it's other financing streams, the level of scrutiny that they're already subject to, and, and things like their risk tolerance as well. And so for this crowdfunding project, uh, what was really interesting to see based on the cases that were submitted by different countries that were participating was that crowdfunding usually involved different streams of fundraising efforts at the same time and really relied on multiple sectors of the economy. So not just typologies, but, but different organizations as well. So it wasn't uncommon for a single crowdfunding campaign to involve online solicitation, the use of various messaging platforms, the use of payment processors, the use of money services businesses, as well as formal financial institutions, um, which is a, a point that Matthew alluded to earlier on as well. And I'll give you an example here. So the Canadian case that was submitted for this project uh, involved an investigation that was made public earlier this summer. It was in, in July, 2023. And the individual that was charged was allegedly part of an international network of ISIL supporters uh, who use online messaging to recruit and to provide money to the group. In particular here, what I wanna highlight is that he used he created multiple different kinds of uh, campaigns on a crowdfunding platform. The, he pretended to collect the money for families in need, whereas the real intent of the campaign was to uh, help resource ISIL fighters and uh, finance terrorist attacks. So part of the funds that were collected by his network were also in virtual assets. And other funds were also transferred through money services businesses, as well as through payment processors to um, a facilitator that was linked to the group. So the case also had an international component, which was a uh, key, because there were other individuals that were accused as part of the scheme in, in other jurisdictions as well. So the, the case is still ongoing, it's in front of the courts, but it does give a sense of the type of activities that we're, we're talking about here. Thanks, Senna. That's that's uh, that's really interesting. It, it, you're speaking there to sort of really multifaceted uh, problems that are pretty complex for law enforcement and the other authorities. Can just there a, li a little bit about the main challenges that that the authorities do face when they're investigating, and what can be done to overcome them? For sure, there, there's definitely some challenges. Uh, one of the key inherent ones is related to the nature of the crowdfunding as a medium itself. So. Fundraisers can be created by anyone. The, the campaigns are usually public, so they involve a wide range of donors, both in terms of geography and also the type of donors. Um, if we think of volume, this is just a, a general point of reference, but in, in 2022, there were reportedly over 6 million uh, crowdfunding campaigns. So in that volume of activity, most of which is gonna be legitimate, uh, how do we spot the campaigns that, that are not? From a terrorism financing perspective, it can also be difficult to determine uh, if donors were wittingly supporting an illegal cause or not. And in the case of the, a campaign, whether the funds that were collected were actually used for the purpose that was advertised or if they were diverted. So that, those are some of the few challenges. Another one is a, a cross-border component, um, which is often the case that the, the flows of funds are international. Um, and that can be very time consuming to, to follow and to try to build a comprehensive picture of, uh, of the scheme. 
And this is especially the case if individuals are using techniques like obfuscation, uh, breaking up their payment instructor instructions or the payment itself across multiple different platforms or channels, if they use encryption uh, for their communications. So that fragmentation really adds to, to the complexity for, for officials uh, looking into to this activity. In terms what, of- what, what can oh, we do ahead. about that? Yeah, for sure. Um, so in terms of what can be done, I think it's it's really important to understand the scale of this activity and the problem set. So being able to collect data about the crowdfunding cases that are, are being detected and to understand the crowdfunding industry itself as well. How does it work? Um, what's common in terms of financial flows and the existing mitigation measures uh, that the industry itself already applies. So that's really key to help inform both the policy approach at the organizational level, uh, as well as as uh, state authorities. And to note, some countries do already regulate crowdfunding. So where that is already the case, where it's a, it's a regulated sector, um, they can submit suspicious transaction reports to the financial intelligence unit. Um, and where those are quality reports, that can really form an important part of developing leads for investigations, for intelligence, uh, to understand what's, what's happening. And the same goes for other types of reporting entities, like money services businesses, who facilitate transactions as well. So every piece of that transaction flow helps build a better picture. And the last thing that I, that I want to emphasize here is um, effective information sharing mechanisms, both at the international level and the domestic level. That's, that's really key to make sure that they're fit for purpose. Great, thank you. Um, maybe if I go to Matthew, I mean, Matthew, you know, the crowdfunding platforms, you sit at the center of all these problems. Uh, Anna there has laid out the, the problem of millions of campaigns every, every year. Um, so what can you tell us a little bit about the steps that, that organizations like yours take to, to manage these risks? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there really is no shortcut for this. What, what it comes from is a strong combination of business rules, machine learning, and human reviews, making sure that you invest in each of those processes so that they are truly robust controls that keep both the platform and the wider community safe. Um, you know, there is no one size fits all for this. It's incumbent on each business to conduct their own risk assessment to really develop an of what risks they face, as well as what good activity looks like, that good activity is not interrupted. Um, one of the most important things, too, that platforms can do, apart from investing in teams who truly understand the work that they are responsible for, is developing partnerships, not just with uh, the public sector, but also even with your competitors. Uh, we do take this very seriously in so much as when we find a typology or a potential risk, uh, we actually do share it with our competitors. We will pass on that activity to make sure that you know, we're not the only ones who are mitigating it, that everybody in the ecosystem is also mitigating it. Great, thank you very much, um, Matthew, that's helpful. Um, I have a, a question, just the next move on to Svetlana, but before I, I, I do, uh, I'm sure many of us here on the call are, are familiar with uh, UNC CTED. Um, CTD, uh, we, I, I, basically, the for those of you who don't, the core mandate of the organization is the monitoring compliance of all United Nations member states uh, with respect to the requirements of the Security Council resolutions on countering terrorism, uh, and also to identify terrorist relation trends and challenges and good practices. Um, so uh, that's uh, Svetlana's organization. Um, uh, I, I, just a question for you, Svetlana, then. Can you tell us, how can policymakers balance the need to encourage development of innovative, new and accessible services like crowdfunding, uh, and, and also to ensure an effective regulatory system that protects against issues like terrorist finance? Um, thank you, Tom, and uh, thank you to the Financial Action Task Force for um, having me over this uh, webinar and, of course, uh, having uh, this important discussion. In fact, the balance that you mentioned uh, is, is really important because the premise 
uh, is and should remain that crowdfunding is a perfectly legitimate financial activity as such. Uh, the development of formal platforms uh, as well as uh, informal social um, uh, social media based uh, tools offer really a potential to provide new ways to move and raise funds uh, for perfectly legitimate causes. And very often uh, this is um, in, in the name of important uh, public benefit. Uh, or uh, serves protected char charitable purposes. So this should really be uh, the, the, uh, the starting point in the thinking of how to regulate and how to uh, find the appropriate balance. Now, what we've seen, and uh, Anna has uh, alluded to that, um, is that some states have started regulating certain types of crowdfunding platforms, um, not necessarily those that are the most used or the most at risk, um, and certainly very few states in regulating the sector have actually turned to the set of norms and, and, and techniques that we have under anti-money laundering and counter-financing of terrorism um, bulk. Uh, so um, Anna mentioned, I think, donation-based platforms and, and Hans mentioned them as well. Um, they tend to be the most vulnerable to, uh, to the abuse for terrorism financing purposes primarily because they're relatively immature and unlike Matthew's uh, platform, uh, have really low awareness on uh, what's there as in terms of risks, but also what's there in terms of tools uh, to, to protect themselves and to identify those abuses. And of course, when terrorists and other criminals look at it um, compared to a formal sector that's more regulated and more aware, uh, they tend to choose what's easier to uh, to abuse and come undetected. Now, um, in this situation, what the UN Security Council um, said and encouraged uh, the uh, the member states to uh, to do is to assess and address the risks that uh, they identify in terms of this sector. So the first step really is understanding the nature of the threat. For each particular state, it may be different. There may be some global threats that apply to all, but uh, different uh, national, regional contexts really define the specificity of the threat, the magnitude of the threat. And so the measures that you develop to regulate the sector must be uh, proportionate and targeted uh, to the threat you identify. So the, the first step, you analyze how uh, vulnerabilities and risks uh, develop in your, in your context, and then you start developing the tailored um, regulation. And what's important there is that it's not a one-off exercise, especially given how fast evolving the trends are, the technologies are, and how adaptive criminals, including terrorists, are to abusing them. So you can't just uh, do one risk assessment and, and produce a set of regulatory measures and then think that the problem is solved. You have to look at it in a continuous way to review, to readapt, to assess whether the, um, the responses are effective, but also to assess any negative impact of these responses on the perfectly legitimate uh, causes, including protected human rights, including the financial inclusivity um, and uh, access to, uh, to services. If you go by response measures that are just based on assumed risks that you thought of and heard of, rather than evidence-based um, measures, then you risk to over-regulate the sector and to really uh, curtail the important uh, advantages that it brings uh, to hamper legitimate activity of nonprofit organization, humanitarian work, and this is of particular importance because uh, in most uh, cases, uh, these are those who are most in need in conflict situation, terrorism affected areas. And so it's, it's really important uh, to continuously ask yourselves those questions uh, about both effectiveness and possible impacts and unintended uh, consequences. Throughout this whole stages, and this is my last point, what's really crucial is to ensure that you listen to um, the perspectives of all the stakeholders involved and impacted. 
um, that includes, of course, private sector as the front, uh, uh, first front, but also the civil society, the research, the government agencies from different parts of the houses. And only by hearing those perspectives throughout the processes, risk assessment, developing regulations, reviewing regulations, you can have a fuller picture and a fuller understanding of what to do with the issue. Thank you, Svetlana. That, that's that's very interesting. Uh, Matthew, could I go to you on that? Just, I mean, Svetlana there mentioned about the human rights aspect. She talked about proportionality and things being targeted. Here in the UK, where I'm sitting, we've had a lot of controversy about groups being debanked. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the private sector's perspective on these things? Yeah, absolutely. And so, Alana, I have to say, I absolutely love the focus on human rights, access, need of aid. These are things that are critically important to us. Really, the similar across the entire private sector, where many of us really did get our start wanting to help solve these thorny issues. So it's critically important that companies have ongoing and honest risk assessments so that they can make sure that the controls and the processes that they implement are concert to the risk that they face and really minimize any disruption to good activity. Um, for that, it's important for the private sector to invest in skilled teams, invest in strong processes, as I mentioned earlier, but also it's critically important to look to the many resources that governments have already promulgated. You know, um, uh, there are folks on this call whose work we have certainly looked to to continue shoring up our processes to constantly improve and to make sure that we are really taking advantage of the mountain of expertise that exists out there. I do want to be emphatic, though, that this does not mean taking a light touch, but really it comes from making sure that you understand your business more deeply than anybody does, taking that taking that guidance from the civil society, applying it to your business, and then really creating a business that you can confidently say is safe, but that also does not get in the way of these very important questions like access to aid, like human rights. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, Anna, maybe can I ask you there, you know, the, the talk there, you know, the, the, the points that are being made of the, the need to take a risk based approach uh, to regulation of this issue um, so we don't have unintended consequences. Could you just talk a little bit about that from a policy perspective? Yeah, absolutely. I think it really all starts with the national risk assessment exercise, uh, just because it is such a foundational foundational piece. So when, when we started this project, we did ask participating countries from, from the FATF membership if they had already included crowdfunding uh, as part of their risk assessment. And only about five countries indicated that they do do a detailed assessment um, of this sector for the purpose of that uh, exercise. So a few others, 16 others, did indicate that they saw methods and techniques related to crowdfunding, but that they didn't do necessarily a deep dive into the sector. Um, and considering that's really the foundational exercise that can inform a risk-based approach and, and policy, I think there's, there's room to improve there um, across the international community for how we do understand uh, the activities and the risks in the sector. Thank you. Um... I have another question, but really just for everyone. Um, all the speakers have so far talked about the importance of, of adopting a multi-stakeholder approach. Um, maybe uh, if I could ask people, you know, how do we ensure that we do have that, that we do have people from academia, we do have policymakers, enforcement, all the different players in this working together, apart from obviously doing things like getting together on these webcasts, what can we do um, uh, to ensure that sort of multi-stakeholder approach happens? Anna, maybe you could uh, share your thoughts. Yes, yeah, so I'll build on the last answer that I provided. So um, I think starting with the national risk assessment is a great opportunity actually to involve a broader range of stakeholders from the get-go. And it's also a tool for engagement too. So not just uh, domestically, although that's a, it's a core component, but also internationally. Um, because crowdfunding is an international activity, the financial flows are usually cross-border. It's super helpful to know what other countries are seeing uh, and some of the patterns that are being detected there, as well as the approaches that are being detected uh, 
the approaches that are being taken to mitigate that activity as a, as a point of comparison um, that can help guide a future approach. Great. Hans, how do you think we should uh, go about this uh, multi-stakeholder approach? Look, I mean, I just want to make a general point about the usefulness of research here. So Matt has already talked about the layers of industries that are involved in just running a crowdfunding platform, right? I've talked about the four typologies outlined in the report and how they can be combined. Um, regulation, industries, government, law enforcement necessarily will have to work in silos. So the banks and the payment service providers have their regulation. The cryptocurrency uh, guys have their regulation. Law enforcement has specialists for either ones who work usually in silos. However, from a terrorism financier's perspective, these silos are meaningless. I'm using a combination of technologies that allows me to do this as good, as frictionless, and as riskless as possible. Therefore, we need to take the entire ecosystem into account from the social media platforms to the crowdfunding platforms to the payment service providers to the banks that provide the backbone for all of this, plus the abilities and the legal frameworks of law enforcement and regulators to actually trying to hinder this. And research, like our organizations or others, who look at what do the actors do, really have a real important role to play because what we see is how they combine those methodologies and therefore can help inform or so be a resource both for the private industry to raise their awareness of what's going on, but also for law enforcement and regulators. Um, where are the regulatory gaps? How are they misused uh, and loopholes? How are these misused to con organize this uh, terrorism financing via crowdfunding platforms? Because there are always going to be gaps and we have to really move away from the imagination that terrorism finances are unsophisticated players in this space. Especially if we talk about the global networks, we have uh, terrorism finances been organizing this for decades now. When I was still at the UN, we were following one terrorism financer who started out in a terrorism camp under Osama bin Laden in 2001 and ended up with being one of the key financial managers of ISIS in um, uh, Iraq with a detour through Yemen and North Africa. So he had seen everything, he has tried everything, and he looks at this as a whole system. And research really not having the constraints of law enforcement uh, in, in these silos can really play an important role here to bring this information together. Very interesting. Um, Svetlana, you mentioned a uh, multi-stakeholder approach. I mean, how can we do that better? Um, there's uh, certainly room for improvement. Um, one of the key uh, messages, I think, that relates to this discussion is that it's not um, really a one-way street. Um, and I'm emphasizing that also in the context of our uh, current work on public-private partnerships uh, in uh, countering the financing of terrorism. Uh, a lot of um, times we see um, that authorities consider that they have, you know, followed the multi-stakeholder approach or um, worked in partnerships if they just send, you know, some guidance or awareness, which is great in itself. It's better than nothing. But it's really a one-way street. Uh, the multi-stakeholder approach uh, that is effective is that the one that allows to hear uh, the perspectives of those stakeholders to listen, to understand, and to take them into account. So what we've seen works better are um, really frameworks and platforms that make it almost a regular exercise. As I said, it's not a one-off uh, you know, consultation or workshop or, or a meeting, it's a process. Um, and, and if they're done on a, an ad hoc basis, again, better than not done at all. Uh, but when they work really uh, effective is when there is a platform and a clear framework of what and how um, all these stakeholders are discussing uh, between themselves on which um, terms of engagement and, and which information or which um, um, guidance they can uh, they can share, which experience they can highlight, which concerns they can bring to uh, to the ears of the regulators, the policymakers. What I think is important from our perspective as UN and also uh, FATF as a, as a as a standard setter uh, on many of these uh, related issues 
is that we do the same that we advocate member states to do and implement in their jurisdictions, that we really truly hear the perspectives of all these stakeholders before we come up with recommendations, uh, standards, obligations, requirements that we then um, try to monitor and uh, see implemented. Um, it's really do what you preach for uh, for our uh, purposes as well. So I think um, this recent opening both uh, of the FATF and the UN towards the private sector, towards the research, towards academia as sources of important um, important considerations is, is, is a welcome development. Um, personally, um, I feel uh, very much enriched every time uh, we open this discussion and, uh, and enlightened really by, uh, by those perspectives. Thank you. Thank you. Matt, um, you know, from your perspective, from the, the, the crowdfunding platform, what, what is a, the optimal multi-stakeholder uh, multi, uh, model look like? Yeah, so I think one of the most important things in, con in considering what that multi-stakeholder model is, is that we all have the same goals. You know, governments are not here to disrupt legitimate business. No legitimate business wants their services misused in this way. And I think that is a really important line from which to work. Um, once we've established that baseline, having such forums as this one are extremely helpful, but uh, really um, ongoing partnerships are critically important, working groups amongst companies with government guidance, as well as safe harbors to ask, um, you know, really more difficult questions, as well as to tender feedback in both directions. Um, from the government perspective, really Really taking the time to learn the issues facing the crowdfunding platforms from a business perspective is very important. And really taking the time to learn how these uh, platforms operate so that they can be both supported correctly as well as have appropriate oversight. Um, another very important aspect of this is being discerning about partnerships. Uh, one of the things that we really look at when we're talking about partnering with governments is the maturity of the AML CTF regime in that country. Uh, as a matter of fact, we do look at the Financial Action Task Force recommendations like, and while partnering with governments is critically important, it is always is important for platforms to themselves have rebuttals to educate their communities about the risks that they may Thank you, Matthew. Um, one, one of uh, crowdfunding's great strengths is also, I guess, its potential weakness in this field, namely the fact that a someone who's who's uh, crowdfunding, you know, can target a global audience far from where they are uh, themselves. Um, so and that creates the problem that though we know that we are donating money to our friend who's doing a charity run, we know what that's all about. Frequently, crowdfunding could involve people very far away um, looking for funds. How can we go about educating uh, you know, people who operate with the best intentions um, to differentiate between legitimate uh, crowdfunding operations and ones that perhaps have a, uh, you know, less positive uh, ambitions? Anna, you, uh, you spoke earlier about a case, I think, where someone did have nefarious intent and, and, and people um, did, didn't realize that. What can we do there to educate people? Yeah, this is a really great question because I think we all have a role to play here. Um, there's two points that I, I want to highlight. The first is that FATF published uh, a list of indi risk indicators uh, alongside the, the crowdfunding report. And these risk indicators are catered to specific audiences. So for example, civil society or the private sector or government authorities. Um, and it's something that can help identify red flags. Basically have a pause and, and think a bit critically about the, the fundraising initiative. For example, is there sufficient information that's being provided about who will actually receive the funds? Um, what about the person that's actually organizing the campaign? Do payment instructions make sense or are they overly complex, convoluted? Do they ask for funds in a way that builds in anonymity? So these kinds of questions and risk indicators are resources that, that governments should ensure that they're sharing with the private sector. 
and that in turn, the private sector is, is making those resources and information available to uh, their customers as well. So that's one point. And the second thing that I wanted to mention is the importance of government making available strategic level information about the terrorism financing threat environment and how it's also changing over time. Um, that's helpful because it puts risks indicators into context. And it can also help better inform the public about why we're concerned about certain terrorist groups, um, as well as different financing mechanisms that they're, they're being used. Thank you, uh, Matt. Um, what can what can the uh, what can the platforms do in this to help with education? Is it can you you know force people starting up campaigns to put more information out there? I mean, what can you do to to help educate people without putting unnecessary burdens on the crowdfunders themselves? Yeah, it's a great question and one that we certainly consider very carefully because the last thing we want to do when somebody is acting out of the good of their heart is to introduce more friction. At the same time, we do want to educate our customers about the risks that they face. Um, for that, we do, of course, require folks to state what their fundraising purpose is. Not only does that help to mitigate certain risks, but that also makes a funder more successful um, in looking at it that level of transparency. Uh, second, Secondly, we always send a we like to send a welcome email to customers to make sure that they do understand how to run a successful fundraiser. Within that, uh, there are certain tips that serve both purposes that I just referenced. Um, finally, we like to, as Anna, really take and distill certain uh, guidance that we get from civil society and academia and make it accessible and relevant to our users. Um, you know, a report from a major international body might not be the most. And it might not be directly relevant to their fundraiser, but we will find ways to make it relevant to them, make it digestible to them, so that we are arming them and equipping them with the information that they need to protect themselves, not just on our platform. But That's great. Thank, thank, thank you, um, Matt. Um, in in terms of uh, that is the. Uh, I'd like now to open it up to the uh, to to the audience. I'm just looking here down at some of the questions we've received. Uh, we've got quite a number, um, so I think we're really going to struggle to uh, to 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 make a huge headway in them. But we're going to we we can try our best. Um, I've got a question here uh, from you and Grant. It is uh, must must. Sorry, much risk profiling is based upon the presence of indicators. Is work being done to identify risks from the absence of something? Uh, is this an issue or not? Um, could maybe um, uh, could I open that up? Is there anyone who'd like to 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 take that? What, what looking for things that are missing rather than red flags? Oh yeah, yes. Hans, would you like to uh, to jump in there? What What do you think? The absence of yeah. of flags. Look, I mean, we we are still encountering the same problem here. So this is not AML. No? This is not looking for patterns, right? Like uh, placement layering and and uh, reintegration. Really, the identity of who's doing what here is really really important. Um, rarely you will see patterns that are recognizable in terrorism financing. There may be because there is a overlap between terrorism and organized crime, which then taints the funds that need to be then cleaned before they can use, be used for terrorism operations. But when we talk about crowdfunding, it will not necessarily be the flow of the funds that hints you. So what you really need to read up is who are the actors, who are the uh, donors, and who are the recipients of the funds. As much as you can figure out about these is what the Factors are really determining whether you can make a case for terrorism or extremism financing or not. That's one of the key aspects and unfortunately the key challenge that remains with this type of misuse, as it does with all other terrorism financing methodologies that we discussed in the project. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I have a question here on something. I I don't know if it's if it is an issue, but maybe, and I think the question questioner is interested too. What are the the thoughts of the panelists on lending uh, based crowdfunding? Is that a problem at all? Anyone is that something that should be people are looking out for? Anyone know anything on that? 
I can jump in here, Tom. Um, Thanks. Initially, yes, when, when we started looking at this question of crowdfunding, realizing that there's different types of crowdfunding, we had outlined uh, lending-based crowdfunding, equity or investment-based, reward-based um, or pre-sale-based crowdfunding, as well as donation-based. And pose that question to the FATF membership to see, in the context specifically of tourism financing, what are the concerns? And actually all of the responses that we received back related to donations-based crowdfunding as being the primary type um, that is an issue in the context of terrorism. So I think part of that relates back to complexity equaling risk. Um, Dr. Han spoke earlier about this isn't necessarily a money laundering problem. In money laundering, we tend to look at things a little bit different. Um, but for financing a cause, the more straightforward that can be, the better, um, especially when it comes to, to new technologies. Um, so introducing things like investments can add an element of risk. And depending on the group, depending on the network, that may not always be an appealing uh, mechanism, especially if they have alternatives. So that's more anecdotal why I think we haven't necessarily seen investment-based crowdfunding in the context of this project, uh, but certainly something to, to keep on the radar more broadly for, for anti-money laundering, anti-terrorism financing. Wonderful. Um, a very quick, quick question I've received in here. Perhaps uh, I should have made this clearer the earlier to answer this. The question is, is there a FAT, FATF report regarding this webinar available after the meeting? I hope everyone's aware is that there is a is a report which, which came out a few weeks ago, I think it is. Um, so if you just Google that FATF report on crowdfunding and terrorist finding, funding, you will find that. Um, there's one other question here. I think I think uh, Hans will probably be the only, um, I don't want to put anyone else in the spot answering this question, but maybe Hans could help on this one. Um, it was, someone's asking, um, which countries or which country is doing regulation in the area of crowdfunding and around uh, terrorist fine type risks uh, particularly well? Uh, well, I don't want to put a country or a region on the spot here, but there is an actual um, annex to the report where you can see an overview of the regulation um, that was notified to the FATF. So, you know, it is still very uneven, and that's where the problem is, because what we are talking about, as I said before, is a classic method now using new technology and therefore absolutely expanding their reach. Um, meaning we're, you're going from a small donation-based campaign in a city to a potentially global donation-based campaign for these terrorism finances. And that's why I also, in addition to the regula regulatory uh, environment having to become a bit more even, and as Vitlana pointed out, please don't kill crowdfunding. This is an important and very legitimate uh, um, uh, endeavor uh, that is necessary for a lot of humanitarian operations, including in crisis areas. Um, the private sector is the really important second part to all of this. Um, the crowdfunding platforms have to be part of the first line of defense. As I said, math uh, and GoFundMe is the honorable ex exemption and the tragedy news is that is the exemption, right? That's the totality of crowdfunding platforms globally um, that are actually really seriously looking into this. So they need to adjust as a matter of standard in the industry, their terms of services to make sure that the words terrorism financing appear because that is the only legitimate reason to build up capacities in a commercial entity um, for countering this misuse. Thanks, Hans. Um, I see we've had a few questions here that sort of somewhat similar, um, and it's about how do we spot uh, potentially problematic crop, uh, crowdfunding. Now, Matt mentioned a few things uh, with respect to education of, of, of customers. Um, people who, who donate money, um, but also we've had questions about regulators. I, I, is there anyone on the panel who could help with that? Things that maybe regulators uh, should look out for in terms of uh, red flags on um, crowdfunding and terrorist finance. Maybe Anna, would you have um, anything on that? Yes, yes, for sure. Um, so where crowdfunding is part of a regulated entity, as part of a regime, there are certain obligations that apply. So for example, having a, a compliance program, um, conducting a know your client, so being aware of who the organization is doing business with, reporting transactions to the financial intelligence unit, 
those are kind of the building blocks of, of effective compliance um, for any business in the context of an AML CFT regime, including as it relates to, to crowdfunding. So, so that is one component. Um, the second thing I think I would echo is training. Uh, beyond just going about, you know, touching on, on the risk indicators, having a really comprehensive program related to training to make sure that analysts who are looking into these issues or, or know what to look for, are aware of how the threat environment is changing and how it affects their particular business uh, as well. Things don't take place in a vacuum, um, they're contextual based, so it's important to keep up to date with um, the latest knowledge related to terrorism and how it affects the financial services industry. So those are two points that I would offer there. Great, thank you. Um, if I could add, it's sort of some, some, oh, actually, no, please, Svetlana, yes, thank you. What, what should regulators do what, to be what red flags to look at? Um, well, I actually wanted just to um, supplement, uh, I think, the points raised by Anna in um, in this context of uh, educating each other and uh, understanding uh, better the phenomenon. I think what's really important and maybe we haven't focused so far uh, enough on is the really cross-border nature of this uh, phenomenon. So it's not limited to any particular territory, any particular jurisdiction. It's really, you can post and uh, start the campaign in one country. And as Hans mentioned, it can uh, take a global um, dimension uh, in, in, in a matter of minutes uh, or less. And so uh, what's important that regulators, but also policymakers and everybody involved does, is exchange information um, in, in, on their experience, but also on, on, on the trends in the region, uh, globally, etc., that they uh, observe, so that they can alert each other um, some sort of early <laughs> warning type of uh, information of where it can end up. And of course, there are other issues that then stem from this cross-border international uh, nature of the phenomenon, including in how people cooperate uh, between, say, authorities in one state and private sector in another state and uh, customers in a third state, etc. But uh, you cannot have a situation where a state essentially approaches this issue in isolation and says, well, I don't have terrorism problems in my country. I haven't had terrorism financing cases, so I'm not going to look at this sector more closely and I, I don't have a problem. No, it's, it's really uh, so transnational that you cannot not know what's happening next door or across the ocean and take it in, in, into account. Great. Thank, thanks, Svetlana. Um, if I could jump to Matt, I've got a, qu a question here. It's about due diligence. What are the specific due diligence measures uh, in this space that uh, that platforms uh, do? Yeah, are, are there anything you can share with us? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, without giving too much away, uh, the biggest things that we will look at are the people behind a fundraiser, really looking to understand who is using our platform, and then looking at the activity that we see presented on the fundraiser. Uh, Quite often, when it's a good fundraiser, it will follow. So looking for those outliers is critically important once we have determined what the expected activity is versus what the activity that is presenting itself is. Um, past that, really looking at any potentially connected accounts, as well as what happens to the money after it leaves our ecosystem, are also very... And, and another question that's the follow-up, Matt, uh, uh, someone asked about AI and... Uh, I, I guess this is a question really goes for every conference and everywhere really. But um, how does uh, AI fit into that? Can it help with that? Yeah, um, AI absolutely, absolutely helps with that. Um, you know, AI is the future. It's extremely helpful in helping us and really any platform to manage the number of fundraisers that they may see every day. But critically important to that, is balancing that with explainability and human reviews. 
you know, while AI is extremely useful, it's not the uh, it's not the one thing that we should be looking at, at least not yet. And so really investing in teams uh, with backgrounds in the financial sector, as well as in the public sector, to introduce the full wealth of human awareness, context and nuance to those reviews is very important. So really looking at AI as a tool to supplement the brilliant humans who are keeping us all safe is a very helpful way of Good. I'm, I'm glad we all still have a little a bit of an edge then. Um, thank you very much. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, I'm first of all, apologies to all the people who submitted great questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to, to more of those, uh, but our, our timing is, is coming to an end. I'd really, before we do wrap up, I'd like to go back to each of the panelists and really ask them um, if they could share with us their key takeaways on, on this important issue. Maybe if I could start just from the top down, I'm looking at my panels, if I could start with you, Hans, please. Thank you so much. So very unsurprisingly, I have a point about research to make, right? So um, <laughs> as I said, this is not a new problem set. Getting money from your supporters is what terrorist organizations have been doing and will be doing. What we see is technical innovation. As we already discussed a little bit with AI, we are not at the end, we are at the very beginning of a technical revolution. So as communications technology and as financial technologies will evolve, of course, the misuse of those will also be involved. As I've spoken about the signups now several times, research really is the one arm that is not, not as constrained as industry or regulators or law enforcement is and can look at these changing methodologies and changing tactics. So I can uh, really be used as a pre-warning. I think this is a strategic FATF move to have this project and to raise awareness of this new technology, but there will be others that are coming down the line. AI is only one of them. Um, so more emphasis on, on the totality of the technologies um, is really important and research can help with that. Thank you, Hans. Uh, Svetlana, if I could ask you just to wrap up your, your key takeaways. Uh, sure, thank you. Um, and by risk of sounding like a broken record, uh, I would like to emphasize uh, really uh, the importance um, to ensure that all the measures that we take to address the threat of terrorism financing, including through crowdfunding or any other method, are really built for purpose. Uh, rooted in evidence-based risk assessment rather than assumed vulnerabilities and are, of course, in line with international law, including international human rights law. Uh, those responses should also be balanced against uh, the potential for new financial technologies to enhance financial inclusion. And this is really a key enabler of uh, various sustainable development goals that, uh, you know, we are all working towards the implementation of as well as for innovating payments as means to transact with them safely in um, crisis situations that I mentioned earlier. Um, the, the real trick here is to find the right balance between uh, under regulation and ignoring the threat and not taking what needs, what needs to be done uh, and over regulation where you just kill the sector, kill the service, or make it go underground, and then you you have bigger problems to uh, to deal with. So that's the trick that we all collectively work together uh, on, and um, I'm sure we'll find the way. Wonderful, Anna. What 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 do you think are the uh, the key things that people should should keep in mind as they uh, uh, from this uh, this webcast? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Tom. Um, from the perspective of a national authority, I think we really can't think of terrorism financing uh, in a silo, and crowdfunding is a really good example of this. Um, one of the key findings of the project was that there's not enough awareness internationally of how crowdfunding in the broad sense is being used uh, to finance terrorism, and also how it links to the formal financial system. Um, we know now that campaigns uh, deliberately lever leverage multiple financing mechanisms. They call for donation in several forms. They use social media and messaging apps um, in a way that's not just for a communication or propaganda tool, but it's it's for a fundraising tool as well. Um, and they they do need the involvement of different financial intermediaries to move the funds. So 
When we look at terrorism financing schemes, we do have to look at them in a way that's holistic and encourage reporting entities as well nationally to, to do the same. Wonderful. Uh, and finally, Matt, then if I could ask you from the private sector, from the, the platform perspective, you know, what you think are the key takeaways here today? I think the biggest takeaway for platforms is be excellent. Um, this means develop a deep understanding of your business so that you can implement uh, and will just keep your platform and community safe, but it will unlock new business opportunities. Past that, really pursue productive partnerships and never stop learning. Uh, for the public sector, I would say to approach any partnership with the private sector from a, a point of curiosity and really take time to learn your partner's placement within the ecosystem, create clear escalation paths for them along with safe harbors and clear guidance that they can then promulgate to their customers, and really focus on the activity of crowdfunding past platforms. Um, you know, this is much wider than just the platforms, and it's very helpful for us to look at the ecosystem holistically. So that's everything from the platforms that we know and love, right over to, you know, sharing a mobile wall. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. And thank you really to, to all our panelists. Um, we've been very lucky to have those different stakeholders all represented here today and to get the benefit of their, their input. Um, so with that, really, I'd like to, to wrap things up and really just to, to make a few points before doing that. Um, you know, I hope that we can take away today that um, we can see that crowdfunding is a rapidly evolving mechanism. It's fast growing. Um, and there is a, a problem here. ISIS, um, Al-Qaeda and other, other affiliates and also other extremist groups have used crowdfunding uh, for financing uh, because there's relatively less regulation. It's frictionless and they like the way they can easily meet, reach a big audience. Um, secondly, um, it's really important to, to notice that the vast majority of crowdfunding activities that go on are legitimate and that it is necessary to support you know, the innovation that that brings access to finance to 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 many groups that that, uh, that otherwise might be challenged and that uh, that, uh, you know, that, that the good that can be achieved um, isn't isn't stamped out through over regulation, as, as Svetlana mentioned. And then finally, um, we do need to accept that the issue of uh, terrorist financing crowdfunding is not well understood. Um, it's essential that countries work together to educate uh, all the stakeholders and also, of course, to, to educate the public. Um, they should be informed of the risks of terrorist financing in crowdfunding. So thank you, uh, to, as I said, to our, our panelists, but also, of course, to, to everyone who signed on today. Uh, thank you very much also for FATF for hosting this webcast. And finally, I would just really like to advise and suggest that, that everyone listening does go and check that report, uh, which goes into all these issues in greater detail. So thank you very much for everyone for joining us today and um, all the best. Thanks very much, Tom. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.